Two billion people want to work but lack access. If you want to build middle classes and you want to build strong economies, you have to help people get jobs. These regions, the poverty rates are extremely high. We're talking about countries where the average income is between two and three dollars a day. We have to keep a relentless focus on job creation. So many problems from sex trafficking to infant mortality are fundamentally rooted in poverty and lack of access to dignified work. It also seems like it's just an impossible thing to get around. How could you ever overcome it when there aren't any opportunities? It is called Impact Sourcing, a unique model that brings tech jobs to women and youth in impoverished communities around the world. Some of the biggest tech companies in the world are using this as clients. Samosource founder and CEO. Lila Jana. She started Samosource. It connects companies such as Google and eBay with digitally skilled workers. I just love this idea. Talk to me about how it works. We are a different kind of technology company. We build tools to connect the world's poorest people using a concept that we invented called micro-work. Through the internet, we can now tap the world's greatest underutilized resource, the brain power of the bottom four billion people. We're making it possible for people like refugees and women in rural parts of Pakistan to access those types of work. Sama Group is a family of social enterprises with a common mission to ensure that all human beings can afford to live with dignity. Technological progress means nothing if it doesn't equate to human progress. Sama means equal in Sanskrit, and our mission is to give work rather than handouts. Work is at the core of human dignity. It's how we define ourselves. It's how we make our contribution in the world. A living wage transforms lives. It is a, an enormous pleasure to be here, and especially to have uh, my bio read by someone like Connie, <laughs> someone of her stature. So I feel incredibly honored, and thank you so much to Bruna, to Kathleen, and to Connie and the board for inviting me here. So I am going to tell you a little bit about what Sama Group is, what inspired me to start it, and most importantly, some stories of the kinds of people we help. We do have a U.S. program that Kathleen was instrumental in getting started as our first funder when she was the COO of the California Endowment. So I do think there's a really exciting possibility for us to expand our work here in San Diego, and I look forward to talking about that more in the Q&A. Uh, so let me start out by telling you the story of a young woman named Martha Carubo. So the woman in the center here you might recognize with a different hairstyle from the video that you just saw. Um, Martha, we've now known for about four years. Um, she was orphaned when she was about 10 years old, and she's from the slums of Nairobi in Kenya. And this photo was taken about 10 days ago. If I stumble over my words today, or maybe over my feet on stage, it's because I got up at 2.45 this morning. I'm seriously jet lagged. I just got back on Saturday from East Africa. Um, and I was there to interview some of our workers like Martha and help to tell their stories. So uh, we met Martha after she had aged out of the orphanage that she was living in. And this is a really common problem in a lot of developing countries. After kids reach the age of 18, they age out of the system that happens here in the foster care system. And Martha was essentially left out on the street. And a young woman who's, even a young woman who's finished high school but can't afford college and has no family connections is left with very few opportunities. In Nairobi, one of the biggest challenges right now is prostitution, especially teen prostitution. Young women who have no other economic opportunity are essentially forced into the sex trade. And Martha told me, after uh, we had connected with her, that this is something that she was seriously considering. She had no other option. She had no other way to fund her, her livelihood. Uh, she lives in a country where youth unemployment is soaring. It's up to 80% in some parts of the country. And at the same time, there's extremely high English literacy and relatively high education levels for such a poor country. So Martha had managed to make it through high school, spoke beautiful English, and was living in a country, and a, a region of that country, in extreme poverty. She ended up making it into one of our training programs at Sama Source, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how that works in a minute. And what this training program led to for Martha was the most important thing, dignified work. 
She ended up getting a job with us for the next two years doing data entry for a number of different international customers. And then after that, she voluntarily left the company to go and pursue a career in travel. She now works as a customer service agent for a global travel company. She serves Kenyan clients. She loves the job. She's extremely animated. She has her own apartment, which she showed me during my trip there. And most importantly, this experience enabled Martha to fund her tertiary studies. So she's now enrolled in college and doing this job. To, to tell you the transformation I saw in this young woman, it's, it's unbelievable. When I first met Martha, she wouldn't look at me. She would look at her feet. She had never entered an office building before. She had never worn professional clothes. She had always been told that she was worthless because she was a child of the slums who was orphaned when her parents both died of AIDS. And to see a young woman like that be confident, be sure of herself, and be excited to go to work every day, earn her own keep, and be able to fund not only her own studies, but studies of some of the younger children in her extended family is really inspiring. So Martha is the reason that I do what I do, and she is, to me, a vision of what's possible when we see people like her as producers rather than simply as recipients of handouts or charity. Uh, globally, 66% of the world's work is performed by women. This includes the bulk of the agricultural work done in developing countries. Women are the farmers and the agricultural producers. And despite this, women earn less than 10% of the world's income and own less than 1% of global assets. I read this in a report by the ILO and I couldn't believe it. I didn't think it was true. The, this is the reality globally. So, this reality inspired me seven years ago to form an organization around the concept of Sama. Sama is a Sanskrit word. Sanskrit is the uh, root of all Indo-European languages, and it means same or equal in many languages. And the idea of Sama came to me through work in developing countries. I got a scholarship totally randomly from a tobacco company called Lorillard when I was 17. <laughs> so big tobacco is why I'm here. Um, <laughs> and um, I was like one of those really nerdy Indian kids who totally fits the stereotype. I applied to every scholarship I could in my guidance counselor's office, um, partly because I knew my parents had no money and I would not go to college otherwise. And lo and behold, like eight months after I had filled in this application, I got $10,000 in the mail from Lorelar, from, from Big Tobacco. And um, it, was, it was intended for my, my college studies, but I felt really weird about taking money from Big Tobacco and spending it on a fancy school. And at the same time, I was really desperate to get out of, I grew up just around the corner from here in San Pedro. I was really desperate to get out and explore the world. I was having some problems at home and was acting like a rebellious teenager. And I managed to convince this uh, organization, Lorelard, and my guidance counselor to let me take the money and go and volunteer in Africa. Now, at this time, I had some community service aspirations, but to be totally frank, this was really a reason for me to go and have an adventure and to leave school a little bit early. So I graduated a semester early, and I showed up in Ghana, in West Africa, in the year 2000, with very little training, and I was told that I was assigned to a school for blind children, and that I was there to help them learn English. So I had all these visions of how I would help these poor, starving African children learn English, and I was gonna come there, and I had this whole curriculum that I had basically taken from my AP English class that I was going to apply to my students in Ghana. And I got there, and I had students who could name US senators. I had students, one of, my, one of my favorite stories is a young student that I had named Femi Abbas, who told me that he had just read Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, and this kid was like 10 or 11 years old. He was a prodigy. And I had students who just blew me away, and I, I couldn't believe that they had grown up in a country where the average income was less than $2 a day. 
And I couldn't believe the motivation that these young people had. And my vision of poverty was that you're poor if you didn't work hard enough, or yeah, I think I'd somehow internalize this myth that we have about the Protestant work ethic and how some people maybe are poor because they don't have it. Well, that's just total hogwash, and it really takes living in a rural village in Ghana to see how hard people are working despite being so poor, right? Or they're poor despite working so hard. So this was a huge lesson to me. I'm a first generation American. My parents came here in 78. I lived the American dream. They had nothing when they arrived but their education. My brother and I got a phenomenal education in Southern California, and I got to go to Harvard through scholarships and through a lot of public investment in me. So I believed in this concept of meritocracy, and it never occurred to me that meritocracy is a myth for the vast majority of humans that we share the planet with. And that I happened to win the birth lottery by being born in the United States. But students like Femi, kids who were far more talented than I was, were stuck simply because of an accident of birth in poverty. And this reality so angered me, <laughs> so confused me at first and then later angered me, that I decided to dedicate my life to understanding why poor countries are poor and figuring out ways to fix that at the individual level. So this concept of Sama is something that resonates deep within me. And uh, one of the things that struck me through my time working in developing countries, after my experience with Femi and living in Ghana, I went on to study African development and then later work at the World Bank. One of the things that struck me most is that poor people that I would talk to on the ground, and this was after years of, of spending a lot of time in very poor places, villages like the one that I lived in in Ghana, um, people wanted work more than anything else. Even when I was at the World Bank and we were working on these massive infrastructure projects, when I would go and talk to people who made less than $2 a day, they would say, it's wonderful that you guys are working on this bridge or that you're working on these loan programs. What we really want is a job. So can I be your translator? Can I be your driver? Can I cook for your academic team that's here researching poverty? And that struck me. It seemed so odd that here we were working on these bigger picture issues and what people really wanted was a job. And if they had a job and if they had a living wage, they could pay for their own services. And they could choose what they wanted to buy as opposed to having it handed to them. So that awareness led me many years later in 2008 to form an organization that was then called Sama Source that connected low-income people to work over the internet. And we had a special focus on women, for the reasons I talked about earlier, and on youth who represent, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, a very large percentage of the unemployed. The idea came to me after college. I was working as a management consultant for a firm called Katzenbach Partners. We later got acquired by Booz and Company. And I took that job after getting pretty disillusioned with the development sector and also facing the very real student loans, um, <laughs> which I am still paying back at the age of 32 to Harvard University. Um, and, uh, and what I realized during this consulting gig was that there was this huge opportunity in this new sector of internet-based work. This was back in the year 2005. Thomas Friedman had just written The World is Flat. And there was this new awareness that the internet could solve the problem that capital can move freely across borders, but labor cannot. Which is essentially one of the reasons why poor countries stay poor, is that even if you have a lot of talent, if all of your talent is locked in your country and can't move anywhere, and you don't have a lot of foreign direct investment, your country is never going to grow, and the talented people in your country will never have opportunity. And so this new awareness that the internet might allow us to penetrate that barrier was really exciting to me. And my first job as a consultant was with a big Indian call center. I showed up there, and in the middle of this super fancy call center, there was a young man who was commuting from Dharavi, which is South Asia's largest slum. And some of you might know it from the film Slumdog Millionaire. And the idea that this young man was waking up in the morning in a place that was known for open sewers and cholera outbreaks, and showing up and taking calls for women in the UK, you know, people in the UK <laughs> for British Airways, was so shocking to me. 
And this light bulb went off in my head and I thought, if this guy from Darabi can do this kind of work, how many more people living in slums and how many more people living in the rural communities before they even get to the slums could be doing digital work? And maybe this is the solution to employment for more low-income people than we'd have thought. The outsourcing industry has generated billions of dollars for a few wealthy entrepreneurs. And I thought, what if we could turn that model on its head and create a few dollars for the billions of people living in poverty by figuring out a way to take the simplest elements of that kind of work, maybe not the call center work, but maybe things like data entry or even simpler tasks, and farming out those tasks to people who desperately needed the work. It was an idea similar to fair trade applied to digital work and the digital economy. So Somasource got started in 2008. At the very beginning, uh, nobody believed in the idea. I heard so many negative comments at the outset. Uh, it was, it was, it's now funny to look back and, and think of where we are. But at the outset, I heard things like, poor women in Kenya will never be able to use computers to do work. It's way too complicated for them. That was something that a, someone at a leading foundation actually told me. Um, there were so many myths about the education level in a lot of sub-Saharan African countries. Many people thought nobody was capable of reading in English. I mean, it was really astounding how many myths persisted when I first started Sama. And what we did is we showed people through the quality of the work that we were able to do that this was a viable idea. When I had the idea, I thought it could be maybe a social business, a for-profit business that had a social mission. And over time, I realized that Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley was really not excited about <laughs> funding a poverty alleviation organization that was using the digital economy as a means to reduce poverty. So it became clear to me that that wasn't a good way to fundraise. And I decided to incorporate as a nonprofit. And I got a lot of advice from amazing social entrepreneurs like the founders of Kiva. So we started as a nonprofit back in 2008, and the mission was to win business from big companies all over the world and to teach very low-income people, starting with a group of youth from slums in Nairobi, Kenya, um, mostly women, at the time we were about 60% women, to do this work piecemeal in Kenya. And in the early days, it was just me sitting in a tiny office in San Francisco, Finally, I hired a guy on Craigslist to do sales for us. <laughs> and we had $25,000 in initial grant capital from two social business plan competitions. One of them was at Stanford. So really no money. I quit my job. I went through very tough times the first year. I think I paid myself $400 a month. One of my favorite stories is that I met a guy at a cocktail party who was a big social investor, and I told him that I was eating top ramen every day, but literally. And the next day, I got a recurring PayPal donation from him that came monthly, and it was simply titled Protein. <laughs> so, so thankfully, we evolved from those uh, very humble beginnings to um, the organization we are today. We now have over 80 staff and we operate in eight countries. And more importantly than all of that is the number of people we've been able to help with this model. Let me tell you a little bit about how it all works. So we recruit corporate clients from around the world. Some of our biggest customers are Microsoft, Google, TripAdvisor, and Getty Images. And we get them to give us big contracts that they would otherwise award to for-profit outsourcing companies. These are companies that operate mostly in the developing world, some here in the US. And we, uh, we outsource the work to some of the lowest income people you could imagine who previously made less than a local living wage. We do the work in Kenya, Uganda, India, Haiti, and now we have centers across the US through a slightly adapted model that Kathleen helped uh, invest in in the early days. And once we win this work, we then put it through a technology system that we developed that divides it into small tasks. We call that micro work. And that makes it very easy for people with little training and experience in internet-based jobs to perform. Those workers all come from low-income backgrounds that we recruit through our local nonprofit partners. So those partners might be missionary groups working in slums. In northern Uganda, we work with uh, internally displaced people's camps to find our workers. They come to us. They've usually finished high school, and we train them to do this kind of work. And for them, it's really a platform. So let me tell you a little bit about what this looks like from a worker perspective. This is a young woman named Juliet Ayot on the right. 
She is from Gulu in northern Uganda. She is also an orphan. Her parents were both killed during the war that they call the Kony War. You might know it from the Invisible Children video that went viral a couple of years ago. Um, this region of Uganda was devastated by a decades-long civil war that saw thousands of young people abducted as child soldiers, as sex slaves, really awful time. Juliet managed during this period to get herself through high school and then like so many young people in sub-Saharan Africa had nowhere to go after that. There are no student loans in a place like Uganda. She didn't have the money to continue. She ended up getting a job at our Samasor Center that we set up with philanthropic capital in northern Uganda. And it's a beautiful center that has, it's, it's inside five shipping containers that we've that we've merged together. It's entirely off-grid, and it's powered by solar panels on the roof. And it's one of the fastest internet connections you'll see in northern Uganda through a special partnership we have with the university. So Juliet is one of 400 young people that we have trained and employed at that center. And what's interesting about Samasource is that it's not just providing training. We actually look at the outcomes long term. When I founded Sama, my goal was to create a poverty alleviation organization that actually measured how many people we moved out of poverty and how effectively we could keep them there. So currently, 84% of our workers leave our organization voluntarily for higher paid work or to pursue higher education. And Juliet is one of them. Um, just to give you a little bit more background on her, she's now been working for us for about two years. Her income has gone from $800 a year before Samasaurus. She was doing casual or informal work, as it's called. So she did agricultural work. She sold vegetables at the local market. She tried various different schemes to build this income for herself. And after, Sama, uh, after joining Samasaurus, she's now making more than four times that amount. One of the interesting things we see among workers like Juliet, they're so motivated. To get to the point where you finished high school as an orphan in a war-torn region like northern Uganda, you have to have extreme levels of motivation. So Juliet took some of her earnings from Samasource and decided to invest them in a pig farm that she started in her home village. She now has a functioning, thriving piggery, and she employs two other women running this pig farm while she's doing her work at our center, many miles away. And this is an example of what can happen when you give someone a job. The ripple effects of this investment in her community are really hard to measure. So we track how many workers move through our system and what they do with their earnings, but it's really hard to imagine what that capital in a place like rural northern Uganda can do. And Juliet's a great example of that. One of the things we track is our return on investment. For nonprofits, we define that as a social return on investment. So we look at what is the return to our workers in real dollar terms for philanthropic investment. And what we find is that for every $1 a donor invests in our model, partly because we're leveraging that money with corporate contracts to pay wages to people like Juliet, we see a 3x return on that investment. So for every $1 invested, a worker is earning $3 in additional lifetime earnings, which is really hard to do in a place like uh, East Africa. Overall, we have now moved over 27,000 people above the poverty line. So all of our workers start below a local poverty line, which is roughly $2 a day in most of the developing world where we work. And we quadruple their incomes after a three-year period. And that money is often used to sustain entire families. This person you see on the right is a friend of ours named Dennis. He's one of our workers also in northern Uganda. And he supports his entire family. His two young boys, you can see them in their school uniforms, are now going to school because he can afford school fees. Um, He's even talked about having his wife go back to school. I've been working on that really hard. <laughs> um, she, she doesn't speak English, and she hasn't been through any education, so we're working on getting her through primary. But Dennis was just able to um, partly complete his law school studies, again, through this investment. So what we see is, a, is, a, is a, again, a ripple effect at the family level for the people who move through our program. Um, I'll tell you now about our U.S. program, which was inspired by our international work. And we, we as you might imagine, I saw some um, questionable looks as I was talking about outsourcing and being a nonprofit. As you might imagine, we did face some backlash. I started Sama in September of 2008, the month of the market crash. 
probably the worst time in recent history to start a nonprofit. And um, I started it because I knew a lot about poverty in Africa. I'd spent a lot of time there. And as we evolved our model and as we grew, I started thinking more and more about doing something in the US. But I faced a lot of opposition. Our own board was kind of against it. They thought, well, we have a name in international poverty alleviation. We're well known now as a global social enterprise. It will tarnish our reputation to do something locally. And I really had to fight hard to get our board to buy into this. Thankfully, after I met Kathleen, two years after we met, we had a, a lunch, which I will never forget, in Los Angeles. And she sat and she said, you know, I've been thinking a lot about what you've been telling me about this potential to do something in the US, and I want to fund your pilot. Then I went back to my board and I said, the California Endowment is going to fund our pilot. Now we cannot say no. And so, <laughs> so we ended up getting the funding to pilot a variation of our model here in the US. And one of the reasons I think that's really important is that so often we see this dichotomy of international organizations working over here and domestic poverty alleviation organizations working over here and there's not enough collaboration and there's not enough cross-referencing of experimentation. Increasingly, poverty is a global problem. And poverty, I think, is more interesting to look at within nations than across nations. Average income doesn't tell us very much anymore. The US has a very high average income relative to other countries, but we have massive wealth disparity. And a lot of middle-income countries are seeing that same trend. India and China are now seen as middle-income countries, but they hold the bulk of the world's extremely poor people. So it's really important for us to look beyond national boundaries when we think about doing this work and look at poverty and the people who are facing poverty. So we thought, what could we do to take our knowledge of the digital economy and translate that to a model that could be effective in the US? And that eventually became Sama School, which is a way of training low-income people to succeed in the digital economy. So we train people, and SamaSource employs them in certain geographies. We take advantage of the new economy. This is something that's really taken a lot of American job training programs by surprise. There's been an explosion in contingent labor. The rate of growth of contingent labor, which is part-time, what we call freelance work, is wildly surpassing that of traditional job categories. We hear about it through sites like Uber and Lyft, which hire drivers, but there is an explosion of these types of sites. There's care.com, which is like Uber for care jobs. You can hire someone to be a home health aide or a babysitter or even a dog walker. There's TaskRabbit for various uh, on-demand services that are, might be provided in your home. Um, Elance and Odesk recently merged to form a site called Upwork, which has paid out over a billion dollars to workers, now tens of millions of people, in the last decade, and is going to be apparently one of the big IPOs in Silicon Valley. So this new economy of freelancer platforms for everything from walking a dog to doing web coding for your small business is exploding. And we are not training people in our own country to be successful on these platforms. Our job training is really oriented towards old school jobs, towards nine to five jobs that are really going away. So we thought, why not take advantage of this explosion in the freelance economy and our knowledge of technology firms and see if we could make these jobs accessible to low income people here in the US. So we piloted in San Francisco in the Bayview District in a low income neighborhood. We soon expanded into Merced, which was called in 2012 by Forbes the most miserable place to live in America. <laughs> I don't know how they came up with that distinction because Merced is lovely, but it's, it's been blighted by uh, a lot of the economic shocks that have hit the agricultural industry. And so tons of people are out of work, including until she met us, a woman named Kristen. And Kristen is a great example of what we can do here in the US. So Kristen had worked as an uh, executive assistant for many years. Then her firm collapsed when she was living in Merced. She tried desperately to find another job, talked to every agency she could find, and was unemployed for four years. She has three kids, and she's a single mom. Kristen found our program at Merced Community College, which is one of our local partners. The way our US program works is we develop the curriculum, and then we find local partners who can administer it to populations that meet our criteria. So we have a very lean team in San Francisco that's solely focused on market-aligned training and talking to those tech companies that are hiring people through these platforms to understand exactly what we need to do to prepare people. And then we 
make sure that the training is done by experts who really understand how to reach these communities. So Kristen came into Merced Community College. She saw one of our flyers at a job fair. And after about two months, we have a 10-week boot camp that she attended. It's on nights and weekends, and it's free. We even give a transportation subsidy, thanks to our funders. Um, she got a job paying $4,000 a month for a firm in New York that hired her remotely as an executive assistant through one of those freelance platforms. And we see this all the time. On average, our US program creates about $2,000 in supplemental income for the people who go through this 10-week program. And on average, our students are making less than the federal poverty line, which is $11,000 a year for a single person or $23,000 a year for a family of four. So that's more than a 10% income increase just as a result of this boot camp. And I think that's only possible because we've underestimated the potential of the digital economy. Uh, we've now graduated close to 600 students here in the US, and we've also migrated this same program back to East Africa. So we now have a training program that spans both regions and a work program that's spanning both regions. Um, and we are very keen to see whether we can do something like this in San Diego. There's still a long way to go. This new field that we helped pioneer is called impact sourcing. And the Rockefeller Foundation, one of our funders, recently commissioned a study that showed that we could hire up to three million people in this new sector of digital work for people who are marginalized. So there's so much room to grow this space. It's a really interesting opportunity for at-risk populations that might have barriers to getting back to work for various reasons. We've talked to groups of formerly incarcerated people. We've talked to groups of people with disabilities. Veterans with disabilities are of particular interest to us. There are so many different issues that can be solved through access to dignified work. Um, this is a photo of me at one of our centers in Kenya about two weeks ago, just showing you what's possible. I will um, describe a couple of other things before I conclude with a QA. and a um, The first is how you can get involved. You can obviously donate. We're at samagroup.co. Um, more importantly, you can think about getting involved strategically. We need more contracts. If you run a firm that has the potential to give digital work, we would love to hear about it. And we're also expanding our uh, presence through local centers, like the one that I just highlighted. So talk to me afterwards if you might be interested in that. Lastly, since so many of you are women and have beautiful skin, I will tell you about a new venture in impact sourcing that we're creating called Lakshmi. Lakshmi is the name of the Hindu goddess of prosperity and beauty. And we created a sister company to Sama, partly to solve our recurring operating cost needs. So this company is owned a quarter by Sama and three quarters by venture capitalists who wanted to support our mission by helping us start a business that could offset our operating costs. We are pioneering impact sourcing in a different category in skincare. And we've actually found natural ingredients right next to where our center in northern Uganda is for Samasource that we are importing and selling here in the US um, as part of a luxury skincare line. So if all goes well, that would be retailing um, at stores early next year. And you'll also be able to buy it on our website at bybylakshmi.com. And this is another way to support our work. And I hope it's an example of how nonprofits can use business models to help subsidize uh, their costs. So with that, I will leave it to questions. Thank you so much for your time today. <laughs>